I think storytelling is really the way we pass knowledge, right? So I, I, I'm really interested. That's an interesting way. I've never thought of it marketing as storytelling, but I totally get that. You watch, <laughs> go into YouTube and watch the Microsoft Zune versus the Apple iPod commercial. <laughs> Which one's still alive? <laughs> Right. And that's storytelling. That's the power of storytelling. So, you know, coming from a marketing standpoint, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, your story right. matters. Like right. how many times do you see in terms of cupping, how many times do you see that stupid infographic go around about, you know, this with the six different circles on it. And one says it's moderate stagnation, severe stagnation, phlegm dampness, like, like who uses that in Western physiology? It's just a scare tactic, right? It's like, it's not informing. It's, a, it's, it's, it's muddying the water, you know? I always think it's funny that people get so focused on the cupping mark. I'm like, but our, if, if I was a surgeon and I cut out a tumor out of a person, would I really be that concerned with the bruise that's left over after? No. <laughs> and I have seen, and granted, I'm on, I'm on the periphery in a lot of different yeah, ways. Yeah. I have a yeah. weird discipline. But I've seen some people in the pain science community lose their mind over contusions being caused by cups. And they always bring out the absolute worst horror story where it's oh, like, sure. I cupped this person for 24 hours and they've got like what look like blood blisters or something. And yeah. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Just a modicum of common sense. Well, it comes back to safe practice, right? Yeah. Like, what is your goal? Cupping, <laughs> cupping, you don't ever have to bruise a patient to get an effect. Now, depending on what the effect you want to get, you may need to bruise a patient. But really, should we be that concerned about it? Well, from an informed consent st standpoint, absolutely, we should be talking about it with our patients. From a ethical standpoint, why would you do harm when you don't have to? However, at some point, if we talk about tissue remodeling with scar tissue, if you're not breaking the little blood vessels within the scar, are you really remodeling it? Right? And I would say, I say, I'm remodeling it. I'm not doing anything. The body does all the work, but you push it in the right direction, whether it's no matter what tissue provocation therapy that you use, whether it be cupping, whether it be an ISTM tool, whether it be stretching, strengthening, whatever. It, the, the physiology of it is the same, right? So... I think it's really interesting to use cupping over scars because one of the things that we want to do when remodeling a scar or one of the ways that we think scar tissue is remodeled is you break those little blood vessels within the scar. I know, I know. cupping can break blood vessels. <laughs> so why wouldn't I use cupping as my first line of treatment? It just makes sense. Yeah, it's it's... It's kind of the, the box thing again about massage. And then most of my practice was spent pushing the edges to try to explore what the boundaries were. And then trying to understand as someone who suffered in chronic pain, okay, like I have to do stuff that allows me to not shoot opiates. Like, right. you know, we have some issues with that in our country. And as a chronic pain survivor, I knew if I couldn't get help, I was going to wind up, you know, abusing drugs, essentially. Yep. So everything I found was on the periphery of this box or sometimes outside of it. It was like cranial sacral therapy wasn't massage. Thai body work wasn't really massage. Yoga certainly wasn't massage. But the more I mixed and matched and blended, the practice, one, I got better. I improved in chronic yes. pain. And then I kept using that with clients and the clients were just completely like, dude, this is amazing. Yes. And I hear this regularly. This is amazing. Why aren't massage therapists doing this? And I go, they keep telling me it's not massage. <laughs> and 
I continue to teach and educate and assume that things will uh, shift as it does, but I feel like there's a, a cultural war we're fighting. One Absolutely. of the distinctions I've made is I feel like I made a very distinct stance in my practice at one point, and I, I, I made the, the, the heretical view, the heretical announcement that science is good. Very nice. And it's like, let's ask questions. And then people were like, you know, getting, getting frustrated. And I'm like, hold on. Science is different than the way Western medicine is practiced as a for-profit discipline in the United States. Yes. You, you got to separate that, okay? That's, that's one piece that like, if you, if you want to complain about big pharma or whatever terms they may use, I'm like, okay, I have my complaints about how medicine is practiced as well, but I don't have a problem with the science and continued research behind it giving us more answers. Sure, and giving us more questions. Yeah. And pushing our boundaries, like it just makes sense. You know, what is it? I always think it's really interesting when you think about the people who are pushing boundaries, well, often they were the staunchest supporters of massage as a, a thing like this. And then they started looking at it from a different point of view because they're asking questions. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe that just takes years. Some people ask questions right away, but I think for a lot of people, it just takes a lot of years to, you know, you got to do have that mastery, that 10,000 hours, if you like, of, of hands-on work before you can go, okay, now that I've got this, what the heck am I actually doing? 